welcome to a really special edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast, because there are three degrees of separation, I think it's fair to say, between not just me, but certainly anybody of my generation who loves football and our very special guest today. Yes, he is a legend. <laughs> He's got a statue that has been made of him because he's one third of a very, very special um, aggregation in football, I think it's fair to say. The best, the, 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 the trio that I think turned football into a must-watch game for many people, but also something of a, a merchandising commodity, although they didn't make a penny out of it. We'll come to that in just a moment. Uh, how can I introduce you? The Batman himself, Brendan Batson, is with us. One third of the three degrees, as they would know, once upon a time, alongside Cyril Regis and the, uh, well, I say late, great Laurie Cunningham. I can say that about Cyril Regis as well. Um, and you, according to your your biography, your memoirs, you were the third degree Brendan, really? Yes, well, yes, nice to speak to you, Dutton. I'm a big fan, as you know. Um, when I can't sleep at night, I, you're my um, go-to person to listen to Thank an hour you. on the radio. So I love, love it, love it. Your virtual jukebox is one of my favourites. Oh, um, great. Yeah, I think um, a lot of people referred to me, well, the third person joining, Laurie, who was there first at West Brom, then Cyril, I made the third, and then Ron Atkinson came up with the... Um, uh, decided to attach us to the, the three degrees. Um, yeah, so um, that's why my book is called A Third Degree. Yeah, I get that. I do get that. Um, I looked at it as you giving the other two the third degree. You know, it depends <laughs> how you read it. <laughs> it depends <laughs> how you read uh, it. And no, one... yeah, well, yeah, that's an interpretation. You know, I'm happy to go with that. Um, now, it was, it, we, we thought about other things. I mean, you talk about the Batman. I mean... Um, Ron is Ron who nicknamed me Batman, and um, that seemed to have stuck as well. But uh, after, after giving some thought, we thought the third degree, and I think it um, it pays tribute as well to Laurie and Cyril because you know people um, associate us, the three of us as one almost at times, and um, it's very sad. I mean, it always chokes me a little bit when I talk about the two of them, but mostly. Um, Cyril in particular, because it was such a tragedy. Um, and he died so suddenly, you know, and yeah, a lot of us still aren't over it, really. Well, and let's talk about that first and go back to the book. And in fact, the match that we want to, uh, the very unique match that we're going to discuss uh, on this edition. I, I remember very vividly uh, Ringo Starr of the Beatles saying, it was just one of those throwaway anecdotes, but it stuck with me saying, look, there were only four of us that experienced that period. There were only four of us. And now two are gone. There's only two. So he only has Paul McCartney to sort of reference, to talk about those days. What's it like for you, the third of three and i wish you a long life of course um and i i wished laurie cunningham who was something of a hero of mine personally and cyril regis i wished them a long life but that wasn't to be but what what, what is it like for you being the curator if you like of of that period of time for those for all three of you iconic footballers it's very difficult, really, to try and summarise it. The best way I can do is, is, is if I relate a little story to you. When Laurie, I only played with Laurie for uh, 15 months. I joined in the March 78, and Laurie was gone by June 79 uh, to Real Madrid. You know, Nobody could keep um, an opportunity like that away from a player. Although I felt he probably was a bit too young to go there. Um, and it was very tragic that he got killed in that car accident in Madrid. But before Laurie left, we had, we had all these series of pictures being taken of the three of us in different guises. And I had this picture of the three of us. And when just before Laurie left, I asked him to sign it. And I had it rolled up in a tube 
you know, stopped the creasing and whatever, I had it rolled up. And when he died, I went hunting for it and I got it out. And I said to Cyril, Cyril, can you sign this for me as well? So Cyril added his signature to it. And then I thought, well, I bet I'd mine as well. So I added mine as well. And I got, there was a request from a studio in Brixton during uh, Black History Month many years ago, asking if I got anything I could lend them to display during Black History Month. So I lent them that picture. They had it for about six weeks. When I went back to collect it, they couldn't find it. Oh, my I would, word. I would, I, would, I would be beside myself. And I said to him, you've got to find that picture. That's the only picture I've got with a three autographs on it. Anyway, luckily they found it. I got it, um, I had it framed, and I, I never let it out of my sight after that. Um, it's somewhere here in Spain. I still can't find it. It's in a box here somewhere <laughs> when I moved, when I moved to Spain. But I think I did find it, particularly after Cyril had, had passed. And every time I look at it, it really almost seems like a shiver down me because Laurie was a, just a tragic accident, really tragic accident. Cyril looked a picture of health. I'd seen him the week before he died, and it was such a shock when I heard the news. His brother rang me early in the morning, that uh, Monday morning, passed away the Sunday night, and it was a tremendous shock. And even when I talk about it now, it still sort of fills me up a little bit. And it does seem odd at times that, as somebody put it to me once, trying to be kind, said, look after yourself, Brendan, you're the last man standing. <laughs> Which I didn't particularly appreciate at the time, although I appreciate the sentiment, but I thought that isn't something I really want to hear. But it does... Um, kind of leave a big void, particularly with Cyril going. And he was such a great guy. He was a better man. Um, when he finished playing football, he became a terrific uh, person. And uh, I miss him to this day, as we all do. Well, you as well became a terrific person uh, when you stopped playing football, um, not least as uh, you, you deputy chief executive of the PFA, yes, as I recall. That's right. That's right. Well, that's right. I mean... You, you, well, you've done a lot. You've done a lot, and you mean a lot. To be frank, uh, for those younger listeners who perhaps don't get the resonance that I'm trying to put across, uh, for a, a generation growing up in what was, I think it's fair to say, a racist Britain in the 1970s and 80s. You, you three, who happened by serendipity or otherwise to come together at West Bromwich Albion, did mean a lot. And you've put uh, some of that resonance in your book. Just give me one moment to get to that. You started off, though, at Arsenal. You went on to Cambridge and then ended up where the three degrees came together at West Bromwich Albion. When you played at West Bromwich Albion, were you aware? Were you aware when all three of you came together at West Bromwich Albion that this was a, you know, a magical moment to a certain extent, but a very important historical moment in football in Britain, but arguably even beyond that, race relations in Britain, and arguably even beyond that, because let's face it, it resonates as much uh, beyond these shores nowadays, what you three represented. It's bigger than Britain, almost. That's a heavy load, Dutton, that you've... That you've uh, you started it. Well, you started it in your book. <laughs> no, no, I was going to say, that there's an anecdote... Forgive me for cutting you. There's an anecdote in your book where you say that, uh, you know, Black people who, you know, we weren't welcome always at football grounds in those days as spectators, let alone as players. Mm. But whenever you guys, West Bromwich Albion, came to town, even though they didn't support you uh, as a club, they supported you three as players and came to see you. That's right. I mean, and, and gradually we got to realise the significance of that. You know, got the dinners and I remember going to... um the Association of Black Police Officers 
and they were saying whenever we were there, whenever we came to London, they would come and, and see us because they were so proud of us. I think we gradually began to realize the social impact we were making because it was being reported in such terms. And I feel that we felt, not, I wouldn't call it a burden of responsibility, but we felt there was a responsibility for us to really kind of do well because we were representing not just ourselves and our families, but also the wider black community. And I think one of the good things was at my time and the players of my particular era, they were more and more coming to the fore. More and more were breaking through the professional ranks. Seminal moment being Viv Anderson being selected for England. You know, and I remember doing an interview with Frank Boff and he was saying, oh, you know, this is great. And he's making a lot of it about him being a black player. And I said, hold on a minute, Frank. He happens to be the best fullback. That's why he's been selected. Forget the colour issue. Um, so I think it was one of those where gradually the impact that we were having, because we were the first team to field three black players, and you couldn't get away from the commentators making those sort of comments around it. Not only that, we have to be playing in a team with very, very good players, playing very good football, which was a huge help. I think if we were playing some rubbish, then I think we um flipping it. Yeah, <laughs> do you yeah. know how much do you know how much pressure that, that well, would have put on us in the community well, if you exactly. were rubbish? <laughs> and on us and on us as individuals, it's bad enough trying to make your way through it. Yeah. I think we were in such a good team, you know. I mean, that team 78, 79 is a really you you get what you deserve. And at the end of all, we, we didn't deserve anything because we didn't win enough games, we didn't win important games. But up to that sort of final few matches, we were playing some fantastic football, particularly mm. before the freeze up in seventy eight. Mm. Yeah, well, the flair. It was uh, there was a a certain swagger about West Bromwich Albion when the three degrees were playing. Uh, mm. Not only because, <laughs> like you say, it was uh, exotica for match of the day commentators, but you you look at today, you know, you see a team like Crystal Palace which is virtually a black team, as far as I can see. I mean, no disrespect to the other players at Crystal Palace, but sometimes, I mean, how, how far can you go? And, and th this resonates with the subject that we're going to talk about, because we're going to talk about um, the football match that might, in today's terms, seem controversial, blacks versus whites. Um, Laurie Cunningham's uh, was, was it Cyril Regis's 11 versus the rest of the world? Let's put it that way for now. Um, <laughs> we'll again, yeah. Yeah. yeah, why not? But, um, you know, you look at Crystal Palace now. Uh, they, they'll they field nine out players that are black and no commentator, as far as I know, has mentioned it. For me, it's actually a glorious moment. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's like if you had... I'm not making a comparison, but nevertheless, if you had nine Ukrainians or nine Scots, nine Scottish players on the pitch, you, you would you would say, oh, yeah, what's going on? This is interesting, wouldn't you? But no commentators have mentioned it. And and maybe that's a good thing. It is. Maybe that's progress. But it feels like we've lost something here because I can imagine the and maybe those conversations are going on, but the conversations that are going up and down uh, the you know, the traditionally black community areas of Britain about this, and it would make us as a community proud. This kind of thing lifts communities up. I don't think it divides communities at all, unless you you know have a sort of a, a warped sense of what's being put across. I agree. Dutton. And I think one of the things, um, I, I it was a long time coming, instead of uh, making reference to the black player, that black player, it was just, we were just players. And I think that's real progress, that there's no big deal now, because, I mean, I, you don't want to hark back to those bad old days, but you could see the gradual influence of players, particularly of my area, as we were coming through, the impact that was having on kids up and down the country. I mean, everybody in the Midlands, wanted to be Cyril Regis, you know, they, he, he, he was glamorous Cyril, you know, big smile, big muscles, big dimples and spectacular goals. Laurie was unbelievably athletic, you know, when he sparkled for that uh, short period of time, it was only West Brom for a short period of time, but within that short period of time, some of his performances were so memorable. 
and that team is still talked about at 78, 79 team that won that won bugger all, but played some fantastic football. And you yeah. mentioned about Crystal Palace. Is it's they're there on merit. That's the main thing. It's not it's not as though they, they're making a social statement. They're there on merit, and that's all we ever wanted was to be selected on merit. But but wait, wait, when you see them though, because I'm I'm giving you my perspective on it, I'm like, I notice it. Yeah. And yeah. I can't help feeling a tinge of pride. It's very difficult for me to support the other team that they're playing. Yeah. And I don't know why. It's not, I swear, it's not for any race reason. It's just, there's something about them that... It makes you I, proud. <laughs> but it's also, I can imagine the cam camaraderie because one, one of the perhaps dividends of the you know, race or racial, or race issues, you know, in a political way, if I can say it's a dividend, is you share a common experience. You know, we, you and I, and most black people in this country share a common experience of racism. It's a common experience. And that brings us together in, in questions of, you know, we will all, sort of understand the George Floyd moment, for example, in a way that speaks to our experience in, in this country. And I can imagine the camaraderie, and, and there is a certain kind of camaraderie. I remember very much in the you know late 70s when there was a lot of race uh, racist activity um, amongst the <clears throat> BNP, British National Party, National Front at the time, and... When you you uh, walk past another black person, certainly <laughs> for many of us, you know, we like, give a nod yeah. of recognition. We don't all over the world, that. all over the world, gotten. You see well, that exactly, black, you're not, exactly, you're exactly. Not, but but that's to explain to people what I I look at when I look at Crystal Palace now. I think what fun it must be for them lot in that dressing room. Yeah, without a doubt, and um, I think it. it brings a different dynamic into a dressing room once you have that mix. And uh, there's an exuberance about it all. And yet you have to be part of it and experience it to understand it. To try and explain it away sometimes is very difficult. But when you're there and you're in that dressing room, irrespective of the mix, there's a certain camaraderie. But I think when you've got that dynamic of um, black players all being together, as you mentioned, having a shared background, similar kinds of journeys may not be pertinent to that individual, but through their heritage, they know of that journey, you know, what their forefathers had to go through to get them to where they are today. And uh, it's all credit to them um, that they've managed to arrive at the top of their profession and um, bring a lot of joy to the black community. Well, you, you will know what it's like for the Crystal Palace players in that dressing room because you managed to have a similar experience. And this is the uh, match that we're talking about, the very unique match that we're talking about, where you got to experience what it's like to be in a dressing room where every or nearly every, but in your case, every other player and sub is black. Um, I've heard the, was it? It was a TV program, so I've seen the TV yes. program a few years back that one Adrian of my Charles. colleagues, yeah. Adrian Charles, did. Yeah, about this. Even then, I think it was ten years ago, now ten or eleven years ago, that um, documentary. Even then, it seemed like what blacks versus white. I mean, in terms of a a um, official match, not necessarily a league match or anything, because this was. Um, a testimonial, a Len Cantello, or the testimonial for Len Cantello, who had played for uh, Wolverhampton, sorry, uh, <laughs> West Bromwich Albion. I shouldn't get it mixed up. <laughs> West Bromwich hey, Albion for, get Lynch for that, yeah. I know, I know, I know. For for well over ten years, that that was the standard in those days for a testimonial. Uh, if players get to that nowadays, I don't know if they ever last ten years in one team. But uh, that that match. I mean, I'd heard, I'd heard um, Jermaine Defoe once say when he was at Tottenham 
I, I read this in the Guardian. He said, "Look, you know, when we're playing five a side, you know, as part of our training, our weekly training, um, you know, every now and then, you know, they might say, okay, let's have blacks versus whites, and that's." the kind of kickabouts we used to have on the street and at <laughs> school you know at school we would say right is we had a huge playground we would say right football match blacks versus whites and literally there'll be a hundred kids on that playground chasing one ball yeah. and yeah. 50 of them would be black 50 of them with white and nobody there would never ever ever be any racial tension as a result of that. Everybody gets it. It's easy. Either, you know, everybody's got a white top on this side, everybody else who hasn't got a white top on that side. That's how you play five a side, isn't it? It's yeah, not, you're yeah. not making the thing about white tops. You're just saying, let's distinguish each other. <laughs> but you what, did that. You did yeah, that. It was, we, we didn't realise at the time that it was causing so much controversy. We didn't hear all the noise behind it. It was just to do something different because there'd been a number of testimonials year after year because, as you say, players were having um, long uh, many years at one at one particular club. So it was just doing something different. To this day, I'm not sure who came up with the idea. But once it was raised as a possibility, everybody said, what a great idea. Let's get it together. And actually, we actually met people, players, that we'd never come across before. Once it got out there that there's going to be this game, some black players just turning up at the Hawthorne saying, can I have a game? I always remember <laughs> Noel Blake. Was, he's a young lad, Noel Blake, playing for um, uh, he at? Villa, at Villa. And I think before we went to Birmingham. And he just turned up. We'd never come. He's only a young lad. And he went on to be a terrific player and a fantastic coach. But it was a real joy and it was fun. But, Dutton, we wanted to win. There was no, it was a testimonial, but we wanted to win that, all of us. I think it was Garth Crooks who said, let's beat those bastards. But, <laughs> I think before even saying it, I think it was in, in our minds that we had, we couldn't lose this game. It'd be mm -hmm. a shame if we lost this game. So we went out, we won it. Well, yeah, I mean, it's flipping out. It's not going to happen every day. And let's face it, you know, in those days, you could easily have, you know, a lot of, a lot of first division, as it was in those days, the equivalent of Premier League nowadays, matches were white versus white, you know. Yeah. And, you know, there's no problems. And let's face it, the, this is one opportunity, the first opportunity for it to be blacks versus whites. Blacks couldn't lose, you know. You just, <laughs> you just couldn't lose. Um, we didn't know the pressure. We didn't know the pressure, but we just oh, knew we had to win it. Just, just for fun, in my house, and I, you can ask my eight-year-old step-grandson this, I, I, I don't put any racism in his head i'll make sure i stay clear of that but just to wind him up i say in our house blacks move first in chess anyway <laughs> that, that, just for fun i'm just winding him up no 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 it's whites move first <laughs> no 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 in this house blacks move first in chess good lesson good lesson yeah, yeah well just to start off with but um this match we're talking about so it's 15th of may 1979 as listeners know we always look at an iconic football match from some time in the football firmament to discuss and it's a privilege to have somebody who was there at the time discussing this um Brendan Batson our very special guest here so you were showing up for a testimonial match blacks versus whites um there weren't a huge amount of black players. That anecdote you made about a footballer just showing up, I can understand that, actually, because there weren't a huge amount. How straightforward was it to get 11 uh, black players, professional players, on the pitch and four reserves? I think we had a, it was like a rallying call, really. Um, just to, This is Lenny Cantello's testimonial. I think his testimonial committee were doing the heavy lifting in that sense. And then we just realised players were turning up. Um, but I think the really good thing was that players were actually asking to come and play. They weren't just being invited. They were asking, can I be part of that? I think in the end, we had we could have fielded maybe another, well, maybe two teams. We had so many players. Um, <laughs> some of them we just didn't even know. We, we knew the, the regular ones, you know, playing at, the, at a certain level. But there were players who turned up and we, we didn't know who they were. And it was a real bonding time as well but outside as well done there were thousands outside coming to that game the black community turned that in force which is great for lenny 
and there was all sorts going. There's jerk chicken being done outside, and all there's all kind of things going on in the streets. So it was it was a great occasion, really good atmosphere, and uh, we thoroughly enjoyed it. That reminds me of when the reggae boys came over for the World Cup in 1998. They played at QPR. Um, I went there with my wife, who was at that time probably about eight months pregnant um, with our first child. And, of course, we had to represent for the reggae boys, you know, um, me a sort of a pretend Jamagerian, as we call them. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, she, she represents for Nigeria as well, but it, it was like carnival. And what struck me, I mean, you mentioned Lenny Cantello there in passing and what it meant to him to have the black community come out uh in support of him, either way, whichever way you look at it, that's what mm. that testimonial was about. It was a similar kind of thing that I can't remember who the QPR player was. Um, the, the reggae boys had agreed to do this testimonial for him pre them going to France for the World Cup. And it changed his life, his post football life, because he went on to be, um, and I, I Apologise, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but people can probably Google this. Reggae Boys versus QPR 1998. He went on to be an advocate for, you know, all the things he was doing overseas and here in the UK, an advocate for community relations and, and so on. So we know these games can have that kind of impact and resonate. I'm so glad, actually, that Adrian Charles picked up on this particularly match because I didn't know anything about it. And many, oh. yeah, exactly. Many people wouldn't have because it wasn't it wasn't filmed. No. Um, thankfully, we've got a photograph or two from it, um, not least of uh, Len Cancelo and Cyril Regis shaking hands with shaking the, hands, yeah, that's right, yeah. the skippers yeah, on the, he, day, on the day. referee and so on in the background. So, thankfully, we've got f photographic evidence because if you go back a couple of generations or even a generation, you probably would have had the photographic evidence, you know, for to see um, going back as far as Arthur Walton and right up to, if you like, um, uh, you know, what's his name? Charlie Williams, you know, who used to play yeah, for... Yeah, Charlie Williams. Um, yeah, Walter Toll. Walter Toll. Walter Toll, obviously for Tottenham, yeah, yeah. First World War and all that. But um, you wouldn't have had any... Or there's barely photographic evidence of those people playing. Whereas here we've got the evidence. We don't have the film footage. There were 7,000 people there at the stadium, which sounds like a small amount, but actually ain't bad for a testimonial. Testimonial, yeah. Exactly, and, um, which is like a friendly, but as you said, this wasn't a friendly. What do you remember about the match then? What do I remember about the match? Well, the, the match is a testimonial match, so it was a bit of fun. But I remember the dress room, what, what great fun. And Ron Atkinson was the manager. Of, he actually managed the black team. And um, it, it was it, it was joyous, Dutton, because suddenly, I mean, I can go back and say I was four, nearly 14 before I played as a schoolboy, before I played against another black player. I was the only black kid in the team, all the teams I played for up to that age. And I came to England as a nine-year-old. And suddenly across the... Um, the other side of the pitch was another black lad when I was nearly 14. So there's suddenly been a dress room where all of us were black. All of us knew of the sacrifices that our parents or grandparents had made, all the things we had to go through to arrive at that moment in time where there were 11 plus black players about to go out, take the field at the Hawthorns. It was a great moment and it was really exciting. And it was, as I said, I've mentioned before, joyous and it's a one-off a one-off only it was three two yeah uh to the cyril regis 11 um garth crook scored one of those goals he won't let me forget it um <laughs> so he probably hasn't let you forget it either <laughs> that's Are garth you? mate <laughs> yeah i couldn't remember I, many years later i couldn't remember who scored the goals I think he scored the winner. I think he scored the winner. I think he scored the winner. Yeah, I don't think Laurie scored one, but it, it was only when the uh, the film kind of even now I've forgotten because the actual goal scoring, the goal scorers weren't well, that wasn't a significant issue because mm -hmm. it's a testimonial. Mm -hmm. 
what was significant it was that the black team won mm -hmm. and put aside it was a testimonial there was a certain um pride that we felt would be um, experienced by the black community to know that their team had won mm -hmm. and that's the way that's where we looked at it, it we, we didn't brag about it we didn't it wasn't something that we we're shouting from the rooftops mm -hmm. it was just silently within us we felt yeah we need to win the game we we're pleased to have won it because it meant a lot to us and to the wider black community but of course the bigger picture is that it was a marker uh, as to what would happen in football that black players wouldn't be idiosyncratic in football um they'll still be having to fight the good fight yeah. as it were um nowadays which is what again on 45 44 years later still having to fight the good fight but nobody is surprised when a troop um you know uh, or a trio or a quartet of black players walk onto the pitch nobody's surprised by that yeah. at all and football has changed almost unrecognisably since those days. But the issues in football don't seem, well, some of the issues don't seem to have changed. For example, you're in Spain right now when the biggest controversy in Spain is about the kiss that everybody will know about now because it has overshadowed the Spanish women's team's victory in the World Cup against England in the World Cup final when the Spanish Football Federation president smacked a kiss on the lips yeah. of one of the... Hermosa, Jenny Hermosa. I yeah. Mean, I, watched, I watched that game and I thought she was outstanding. I mean, I didn't know too much. I don't know too much about women's football. I'm, I'm watching in the World Cup and I thought she was so elegant. She's quite tall and I thought she was central to a lot of the stuff that they did. And then I believe I read somewhere that it's about 45 minutes before they actually received their medals. There was all sorts going on. I, was going, I didn't watch anything after that. And I didn't know anything about this kiss. Now, you've just mentioned it about it's overshadowed. I would like to think that people remember the game for what it was. I mean, that's a fantastic result for the Spanish team, but also for the Lionesses, two um, uh, teams that hadn't appeared in a World Cup final being there. And Spain come out on top, and deservedly so, because they were the better team. They played some terrific football. Now, I would hate to think that this episode has overshadowed, as a lot of people are saying, the achievement of both teams, but also but mainly the Spanish team, because they were the winners. But certainly, it seems to have been handled horribly, and I can't understand how he is still in, his, in, the, in the post as president of the Spanish FA. I really, I really don't. Well, we know what the outcome of this will be, and the outcome will be that he won't be in that post for much longer. But meanwhile, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't know anything about it. I do suspect that there's more to this than we know always, at this stage. Always. So you're always fearful as a journalist not to um, transgress, you know, to make sure that history is on your side rather than the opposite side of what you say. But it's still, it's significant. I mean, you, you said a moment ago that you would like to think people will remember the game for what it was. Great match. Mm. And that's the way I look at this particular match that we're talking about on the 15th of May, 1979. For want of a better way of describing it, whites versus blacks, <laughs> which makes me laugh. I, I went to school on Black Boy Lane and they've had to change the name subsequently. Yeah. Just about, you know, last couple yeah. of years they changed the name. So you can imagine, we used to call our school road White Boy Lane. And I thought that was hilarious when I was a kid. but um. It does feel as if this game, whites versus blacks or Cyril Regis 11 uh, versus the Lenny Cantello 11 <clears throat> was a significant moment, like I was trying to say, because it's not long after this that we start seeing more and more black and particularly black British players. You know, you mentioned West Ham earlier on and had Clyde Best, yes. They yeah. had Addy Oka. They'd had... Players Charles from overseas, mm. yeah. yeah. Well, Charles Brothers from over here, I would say, but um, okay. certainly with jo um, Clyde Best and Ade Coker, they were importing players who had a great impact and wonderful players. But 
it's something else when you start seeing black British players come onto the pitch because they are you. If you are a certain age, you know, they are you. It's like, whoa, you know, I remember we used to run out. Is that so-and-so? We used to run out around the corner together. I can't believe it. We used to go raving together and all that kind of stuff. And it does feel as if your match was at a significant point where there's change coming. But I also think you can reference backwards. You can reference backwards. If you look at what you said was, if people take this match for what it was, what it was, was, if you like, a race-inspired race match. Now, is that even the right way to describe it? But certainly, we know that the two teams de decided, for whatever reasons, to divide on racial lines, and yet there was complete harmony amongst the players, the white players included. They weren't thinking of any other, um, you know, other angle to this, but what a great match. What a great idea. Whoever thought, whoever thought of that idea is a flipping genius. I can hear them saying, you know, um, and that's exactly what that important match on Christmas day in 1914 was. Remember, everybody goes on about that match that was in no man's land, the no man's land yep. football match between uh, the Germans and the British troops. And football enables them to put down their arms, to put down their beef, if you like, in the sort of way that the youngers would just say now, nowadays, to put down their beef, come together, and have an opportunity at least to think, actually, we don't have a beef, do we? What is this all about? And when I look at the, the this match, and I, I think it is important in that sense, you know, Brendan, when I look at this match significantly from the benefit of hindsight, I think that's what it was. I think we may not even have understood in 1970. I, I don't know if you guys did, but certainly us, now reflecting that a match like this would have the kind of impact to say to us, it's not about the colour of your skin, you know. I know it is for this match, but actually it's not because look what happens. We're all we're all we're all mates. We're all having a good time. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, it's funny because I don't think it was billed as blacks versus whites. It was a Sil Regis eleven versus Lenny Cantello eleven. I think it's later on particularly when Adrian Charles was doing a program that it got billed as blacks versus whites. But the significance of it, I don't think was really something that we thought too long and hard about because this was just a game. We didn't think about the social impact or the political aspect. It was, it's only later on where people talk about it could be devices and divisive and it wasn't good for race relations. And I just thought I was a little rubbish. As you've mentioned, referencing the, um, the, the First World War, that you, you put down your arms and you have like, it's, it's a game. And that's why football is a global sport. Because, you know, I used to do, when I used to do some talks back in the day, and I'd go into a room, I'd, I'd sometimes carry a football with me. And I would pretend I'd, actually, I'd drop the ball. You know, nobody picks it up. If you drop a ball amongst a crowd, what do they do? They kick it. The first thing they want to do is to kick it. And almost unbelievable, a little circle appears because, you know, the first person kicks it and the other one wants to get it. And, you know, it, it's just so infectious football. It it does bring people together. And yeah, if you don't kick it, you do a little dribble. You know, you, you show your little skill, the little back pass, or your little, um, you, you know, whatever. In the right. ball, holding the ball, yeah. he's going. Don't hold the ball. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but we 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 you look back on it, and it's a benefit of hindsight. You look at it, and you go, "Crikey!" If you try to do that now, you you couldn't see it happening. You just couldn't see it happening because of all the issues around race relations and, you know, I've, I've, I'm fearful that things are going the other way and Brexit's had a, a negative impact on stuff in terms of race relations. So it, you look back on it and you go, you're proud to have been part of something significant, even though we didn't know the significance of it at the time. Well, it's it, we can talk about this match for ages and maybe there'll be more to come about this match. Um, let, let's broaden the conversation out because you're the three degrees for a reason. 
you know, and you're the third degree for a reason. And of course, the three degrees, or at least Sheila Ferguson was uh, walking the corridors of Buckingham Palace at this time, of course, because she was beloved by our current king, as I, I recall. Um, you've had an MBE and an OBE to your name, by the way. Uh, so you know what it's like yeah, uh, going around in Buckingham Palace, don't you? You know, don't worry. So do I. So do I. Don't <laughs> worry. I'm not embarrassing you. Don't worry. I'm not going down that road. But I am going down the musical route because we always try and have a look at uh, the charts of the day just to give us a sense of where we were I think not just musically, but philosophically at the time, often music in the charts reflects either the politics of the day, the, the social context of the day. You know, you be 40, Birmingham band, as you know, come mm -hmm. around at the time of mass unemployment. And their song is about, or the, the, the name of their group is, um, is uh, reflective of, the um you know the 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 dole card that you used to have at that time but you know they were reflective of the times and so on um do, do you remember much of the music around this time in 1979 uh it feels to me and i'm looking at the charts it feels to me as if this was something of a desert period uh, musically or maybe not for you well around that time i mean <clears throat> Around that time, I remember particularly 77, because that was when Bob Marley was really, you know, hitting the, hitting the straps. Um, and I always reflect on that one of our big fans was Eric Clapton. And uh, Oh, no, I know what's coming. I know what's coming. Yeah. Go on. There you go. Yeah. You know, you're a music man, you know what's coming. So, yeah. um, and I can never forget, I went to see Bob Marley in Finsbury Park in 77, because my daughter was born August 77. And the excitement around seeing Bob Marley live was quite in incredible. That was, that was at the Rainbow in Finsbury Park, wasn't Rainbow it? Rainbow Theatre, Finsbury Park. Yes, I remember My wife was heavily pregnant. Yeah. And we were, he came on. Or well, when that music started, the flipping, <laughs> the bass, it felt like somebody was hitting in your chest. Of course. And my wife grabbed the belly and said, Christ, I'm going to have the baby now. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Thankfully, she didn't because it was yes. going along a, a few months later. Yes. But the other thing I remember, Dutton, was around that time was police. You had UB40, but police came on, mm -hmm. and they had, their, I think their first hit was Roxanne with that reggae beat. Mm -hmm. And I think that was uh, somewhere around that time. And we had a, my teammate at the time, Derek Statham, he, I think he was the one that first sort of brought the police to my attention. And he said, you've got to listen to this group, all white, and yet there they were playing Roxanne with a heavy reggae uh, tone. And mm -hmm. uh, can't be a great, a great band. But yes, there was, I think uh, around that time, I don't know if Steel Pulse or you had um, yeah, Third World. Yeah. Third World, I saw well, Third World in Birmingham. I think Steel Pulse came about 77 because yeah. the Ku Klux Klan, their first single, no, Naya Love was their first single, actually. Naya Love is it's a brilliant track, but it didn't really get much traction on their albums. Um, they that was 77 because I remember seeing them in 77 when all the punk thing was going on. And funny thing was, Police were one of those bands that united the two strands of youth movements there because, um, culturally, youth movements were in the main not completely black and white, you know. Um, there was this soul thing going on between you know, the reggae audience and the punk audience. There's a little okay, soul yeah. thing going on that we going on for a while, which brought um, the demographics of black and white together. But um, you either was a reggae head or you were like a soul head often enough if you were black. Yeah. But if you were white, you're more likely to be <clears throat> a punk because that was the big youth movement. Or by now, it's probably new wave, you would call it, with uh, the police and that. But the, the 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 two strands, the two musical strands, often gig together. So you went to a reggae gig, as you know, you went to a reggae gig and you're as likely to go to a reggae and punk gig, even though... The two sort of musical. I didn't do punk. I must tell you, Dot, I didn't do punk. Oh, I did. I did. I did. It wasn't was, was my. It wasn't my bag. I must admit. Yeah, but well, <laughs> you obviously like to dress up, didn't you? Whereas we like to tear our clothes. Right. Okay. <laughs> but I, I remember that time. I mentioned Third World, 
because they were coming up and they they they, they rose and seemed to disappear. I think there's lots of infighting, but I saw them at the Birmingham Odeon around mm -hmm. '79, and they were the heir apparent to Bob Marley, but they never lasted a pace. And well, yeah, they. I don't know. I think they made a mistake by doing "Now That We Found Love," which is the only tune by them that you will ever hear on even the sort of uh, yeah. revival radio stations. Now that I mean. You look at that first album, 96 Degrees. 96 in, Degrees, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. And Journey to Addis was, I think, the first one. They've got so many beautiful tunes on that. They've got... And they had a great set. I must admit, they had a great they're set. They're amazing. They're amazing. amazing. They're, they're, they're musicians, amazing. though. That's the difference. They're All of them are proper, proper musicians, yeah. you know, who'd gone Your to... Your knowledge is far greater than mine, Don. Yeah. No, 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 it's not that. Um, it's just that I remember that. This is my era, remember? Don't ask me about what's going on nowadays. Um, just a thought, a musical thought, but actually it has got resonance elsewhere. Because as you said, it was uh, um, Ron Atkinson that gave you that tag of uh, the three degrees. And I'm sure you brought some musical culture into that dressing room. How was he about it? Because obviously history judges him through a different lens now. Yeah. Yeah, it was a very difficult time for, for, for me with Ron because obviously our relationship goes back to 1974 when I first when he became manager of Cambridge and um progressed, you know, he was very instrumental in me um progressing my career. You know, he was the one who gave me the chance to come to West Brom. And uh, I would like to think that I replay I repaid his faith. But um, it's a very difficult time for both of us, him in particular, with that episode. Um, and it was amazing to me that he could say such things when, by his actions, he was so supportive, not of black players per se, but of good players. He gave us all an equal chance. Whereas I grew up at that time whereby I was hearing all these rumours around, um, oh, black players, they don't like the cold, they're lazy, they're this, they're that. Well, that whispering campaign was almost like a turn-off to a number of young black players who had aspirations to become professional footballers. And their parents wouldn't allow them. They were, we were few and far between anyway. But their parents wouldn't allow them to, to take up apprenticeships. I remember playing with one lad who'd been offered an apprenticeship at Tottenham. And his mum and dad said, no, you're not going to do that. Go and be an electrician. Go and get a job. You're not going to, you're not going to make it. There's no black players. And that was, that's the tragedy of that particular era. Yeah, well, every era, because your parents have to sort of guide you to not make the mistakes that they see that are waiting for you out there. And, you know, they don't always get it right. And your parents are also behind the curve. I, I feel a bit bad now that I realise what my old man was talking about. I feel a bit bad that... Oh, yeah, the reason why it didn't resonate because it sounded like something from the 50s or 60s, you know, when there's, I grew up in the 70s and 80s and the, 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 the mantra of, you know, get a true profession sort of thing, it didn't kind of make sense, particularly, like I said, when there was a lot of unemployment. Why are you going to go and get a profession when you can't even get a job? So there was a new kind of, for the generation that's coming up in my day, there was new kind of thinking about these things. But the Ron Atkinson thing, and if I might just um, just ask one more question about this, because how it impacted on me, and I was a broadcaster at this time, and I can tell you, it knocked me for six. Because, like I'm trying to say here, when you hang around a lot of, you know, a diver community let's say you know if you live in Hansworth and you you are familiar with the culture of people from somewhere else and what they bring to the table in terms of musical influences or um cuisine or whatever it is um <laughs> And let's face it, all my white friends did love our cuisine, you know. They, yeah, did, love, they did love coming around on a Sunday uh, to come and eat some rice and peas or whatever it might be. And uh, they did love that. Um, you know, you don't expect them to be the ones 
that make and the comment we're talking about is a comment he made on TV for those who don't know about the Chelsea player Marcel Desailly at the time when he thought that the microphone was switched off and it came across and it wasn't even the use of the racial epithet that destroyed me the most it was the use of the adjective lazy which is as old as the hills in the history of black um, experiences in the West over the last 500 years. <laughs> and it's the irony of enslavement and everything is that we could possibly be regarded as lazy. I mean, I genuinely, when Ron Atkinson said that, and remember, I'm, I'm a football fan, and it's he didn't have to tell us that he had given a lot of black players an opportunity because we could see that. And he, I think he certainly let me down, but I was just gobsmacked about the use of the word lazy. How do you, how can you explain it? You can't, doesn't no matter how much I try, you can't. I mean, you, you said that it knocked you for six. Well, it flipping knocked me out of the park. I, I was absolutely flabbergasted. I was so disappointed. I was very angry because I couldn't believe those words had come out of his mouth. A man I'd worked for for so many years, who I had a great respect for, um, that he could use those words against a player. You know, you're talking about one of the world great players. All right, he may have had a bad game, all right? Say he's had a bad game. But to describe him the way he did, and one of the things that really upset me when I did speak to him was he said to me that I thought the mic was off, which made it even worse to me. Now, you know, time passes by, things happen, and we are sort of, uh, using the term, reconciled. But... Forgive, I can't forgive that particular issue, but we got on with it. Um, yeah, you have to, though, you don't to, you? You, you, you have to. You can't carry a grudge all your life. So, well, also, there's something about friendship, I think, which ironically is stronger than race. You know, it's, I'm, I'm using that in an ironic term that. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I think you're right, Dutton, because I I do have a friendship with Ron. It is a player manager initially, but we became friends much, you know, afterwards, and we were good friends. And I still see now. And I mean, I'm in Spain, and you know, we chat and whatever. Yeah. But you know, it was a really sad episode, and one that I find it very difficult to forget. So let's talk about the musical swagger that you three degrees then brought to that dressing room at West Bromwich Albion. Who who was the coolest out of the three degrees? I think Laurie was really. I think Laurie was the coolest. Yeah, he, he he was um very athletic. Very, he did a bit of ballet apparently. Um, yes. as a kid growing up, that's why I, I was reading this in your book. Yes, yeah, <laughs> athletic movements, or whatever. But I think Laurie had a certain. He was quite a introvert of the pitch I call it cool but he was a very he was an extrovert on it but there was a certain swag about him he loved his clothes he carried himself very upright and um there was a calmness about Laurie, you know and he just seemed to be um in respect of what was going around him he just seemed to be quite calm you know my first i, I mentioned in the book my first day training him and cyril came picked us up he got himself lost took the wrong exit on the motorway, but we were driving. I said, we're going the right way. And he, he very quietly went, we're lost. Not that he's lost, <laughs> we're lost. And so my first day of training, I'm late, you know, uh, which is not a good, uh, a good um, uh, sign, really. But uh, I think Laurie was quite a cool character, a cool cat, as we used to say back in the 60s and 70s, yeah. Uh, would it have been he who had the, you know, who's down with the music the most? Okay. Well, he loved dancing, and he was a very good dancer mm. because of his da ballet. But um, I'm not so sure, sure. Um, I, said, I, I didn't really get to know Laurie that well. You mm -hmm. know, 15 mm -hmm. months. You know, um, 
him and Shrews go out to London a lot, the mm. weekends or what have you. Um, and we socialized quite a bit, but we didn't, I didn't really get to know him wonderfully well. Mm. It's like I got to know Cyril. So out of you and Cyril then, who, who's the music master? Oh, that'll be me. That'll be oh, me. Well, I'm glad that we've got you for this uh, <laughs> look at the official so, so Cyril, Cyril loved his music as well, but um, I, I always said I grew up at a, one of the really sort of rich eras, Tamla Motown. At the, you'll remember it, uh, down the um, Seven Sisters Road in Tottenham, uh, um, Tottenham Royal. And we used of to go course. And- Are you yeah. having a laugh? It's not on Seven Sisters Road, but you would go off at the Seven Sisters yeah, tube station and walk yeah. down Tottenham High Road. But yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. The, so, the Cray twins used to go there, you know. Hey, tell me about it. <laughs> tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> but the um I, I always remember seeing Ike and Tina Turner and the Iclets. At the Royal. At the Royal. No the Royal. way. They were, we'd never seen women move like that in our life. I think I was about oh, 14, 15 years old. 100%. You can imagine the impact on a 14 or 15 year old watching these women on stage. And then I remember going to see James Brown mm-hmm. some venue in East Ham. I was playing mm-hmm. the next day for the youth team, but and he was horribly late. Mm, of I'm, course. I'm, I'm going to be flipping, I won't go to sleep, and I'm going to have a terrible day the next day and playing that. But I think it's one, I saw, I saw him many years later, Dutton, at mm-hmm. Wolverhampton Town Hall. When he was in his <laughs> um, but what a, I mean, we talk about Michael Jackson, but to see uh, James Brown on stage, walk on stage, oof. and burst in fact, the James like, Brown and Tina Turner um, were regarded as the hardest working individuals in their respective, um, you, you know, demographic group in in the business. Tina but, Turner um, was regarded as oh, the female yes. of James Brown. Yeah, the the the. Little Stevie Wonder, we saw him. I saw him. Oh my, well, he's not little anymore, but yeah, I know what well, you mean. Yeah, he dropped the moniker little, didn't he? Yes. And um, and then the one, the one I remember because of his voice was Marvin Gaye. Oh, oh, you, oh Marvin Gaye. Yeah, I never saw Marvin Gaye live until today. I, I I feel like I was deprived of that opportunity because he'd by the time I could afford to go and see Marvin Gaye, he was already in his um, sexual healing moment yeah. and. The audience, although he was living in Belgium at the time, and you could go over and see him quite regularly perform on the continent around Belgium, Holland, and so on. But from what I understood, it was kind of like a a middle aged ladies thing by then, and I was just a teenager, mate. Otherwise, yeah. I'd have gone. That's my excuse. Anyway, well done. Yeah, well, how, yeah, yeah. how do you remember the that? Gig? The title of the song gives it away there. Well, yeah. <laughs> the thing I remember about him is that he was in a in a suit. I can't remember exactly, but. His voice was effortless. You know, yeah. sometimes you see singers where they've got a, oh my word. They, they, a note, they, 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 you can see him sort of not straining, but really having yeah. to. Yeah, he was effortless. Yeah, yeah. And he, was, and he, you talk about being cool, he looked so cool. Oh, Mr. Cool. Oh, Mr. Cool. His voice, his voice. I never, I mean, I, I love Otis Redding, listen to Otis Redding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slightly reckon, older. Yeah. yeah. But you reckon from the time they started to sing, when they heard the voice, Mm. Then they had something special. Oh, yeah. And Marvin Gaye was, was just fantastic. He yeah. is the man. He is the man. And, you know, Otis Redding, if he'd lived a bit longer, but his voice isn't quite... Marvin Gaye is more on the sort of Sam Cooke yes. uh, kind of voice, whereas Otis Redding, that's almost like Little Richard for me. He had, he had a lot of muscle in his voice, didn't he? Oh, he yeah. Did, oh, yeah. Uh, very he, emotional. He, yeah. Oh, and it was great because that's church, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not forget where we grew up, you know. Um, in the charts this time, though, no Marvin Gaye, <clears throat> no Otis Redding. You won't be surprised about that. And, uh, oh, maybe there's well, one or two Motowns. Well, in- the other the other one, like I mentioned, is um, um, Isaac Hayes. Now, oh, yes. Isaac Hayes, I saw him as well oh. at... At the, at the um, Rainbow Theatre, Finchley Park. As well, okay. As well. And a few months later, I was a young lad making me through Arsenal. I'm in Toronto. We had a tour. Arsenal took me along. And we stayed at the Royal, the, the, the Royal Hotel in Toronto. And then we went on to Bermuda for a few days' holiday. And oh, and um, he's a, Isaac Hayes is appearing at the O'Keefe Centre, this big concert hall, next to the hotel. 
And I met <laughs> band. I went to see him, so I saw Isaac Hayes twice in a few months. But the thing with Isaac Hayes, I remember, is that the first time I've seen a band with a full orchestra, literally a full orchestra behind him. And it was yeah, a celebration, of course. He came across on the wave of Shaft. Yeah, yeah. And that was... And he's a classical composer. You listen to the score of Shaft, and yeah. you know that he's a classical composer. This guy should be, you know, composing for film music and all that kind of thing. So he needs an orchestra. Um, great, great concert. Great concert. I've the heard... Stage present was fantastic. One of my favourite live albums is Isaac Hayes... Black uh, Moses? Yeah, Black Moses, but at... Lake Tail. Tahoe, yeah, Lake exactly. Tahoe. Yes. Yeah, yes. Lake Tahoe. Yes. I've been there actually, Lake Tahoe, but he's in the South Lake Tahoe, not the North, where they wouldn't allow a concert in the North. You know, it's very posh North Lake Tahoe for your re reference. But that album, he does this uh, 20 something minute version of Never Can Say Goodbye. Yes, that's right. Yeah, Adam and Vinyl, Adam and Vinyl, but um, they were fantastic. Um, he was a fantastic artist and a great performer. Yeah. I don't know if you know, my missus is the queen of Lovers Rock, um, Carol Thompson. So she's done a version of Never Can Say Goodbye, uh, which I love. It's a beautiful version. And I should prefer that. But actually, I will give I will give Isaac Hayes his dues, despite my um, my necessary marriage ties. I have to choose his version as the very best. Better than Gloria Gaynor or anybody else's. Never can say. He slows it down and it becomes so lush. He takes his time over it. It becomes so... You never want it to end. After 20 minutes, yeah. you're like, no, right. no, no, don't do this. Just just a few more minutes, a few more bars or whatever it is. It's so beautiful. Anyway, uh, so which of the... Oh, by the way, you haven't mentioned the three degrees who were in the charts, ironically. They're at number 27 in the <laughs> charts on this day in 19, May 1979, did any of you go and see the Three Degrees? Yeah, we did. We saw them at, um, they were paying, that's how we, the, the photo came across, because they were paying in Birmingham. Um, I think it was called A Night Out in Birmingham. And um, they invited us to the concert and uh, we went along and we saw, we saw them perform live. Yeah, it was, uh, oh, they're great. I mean, Sheila Ferguson dominates, but um, they, they were all very, very good and um, lovely sound. I think you'll have to, you'll have to ask um, our current king um, about their music because I'm not that au fait on it. One of these days, I'm going to ask the current king about their music and I'll tell him that you're not very au fait on it. But what about at number 30, just three places below uh, the three degrees? You've got Boogie Wonderland there, Earth, Wind and Fire with the Emotions, a classic till today. But I'm, I'm assuming that you're more of a soul boy and that this would be perfect for you. Well, yeah, but and and what a dynamic group! And um, I've got the name of the uh, the lead singer who passed away a while back. But I mean, they um, they were fantastic on stage. Yeah, you know, they were... Maurice White that passed away. I can't remember who yes, passed yes, away. Yes. Yeah, okay. I never saw them. I never saw them live. Yeah, um, no. I saw them live. I saw them live in Los Angeles when I lived in Los Angeles. And unfortunately, my memory of the gig, which is a brilliant gig, but my memory is overshadowed by what happened next. I can't go into it. I'm too embarrassed. And dear, oh dear, there should be a law against it. Let me just leave it like that. Uh, yeah. Or you, got should be, you got me thinking now. Well, there should be a law against her. Let me stress that point, for goodness sake. Oh, my goodness. I've never seen anybody. Let me just tell you this, because I'm not going to tell. I'm too much of a gentleman to go into details. But let me just say, if you are obliged to chaperone a woman um, to a concert, be careful when she starts drinking wine out of a carton. Yeah? And that kind of wine does things to people that shouldn't be done there should be a law against it and certainly government health warning as well I mean, let me leave that to one side it's got absolutely nothing to do with the conversation we're yeah. having. um what else in the charts caught your eye roxanne you mentioned already the police yeah uh, this is their 97 yes. version because it would have come out in 77 i think or maybe yeah, right, right. And, um, i thought it was later than that but um i think roxanne, it, was it might be it might be no you you, you might yeah. be right 
Um, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I think you probably are actually. Yeah, 78, yeah, 78. Yeah, no, I think you're probably right. And you've got the Jacksons in there, which is your Motown thing. Shake your body down to the ground. I'm not well, sure we should be talking about the Jacksons in this period because they were rubbish, weren't they? I saw them, the Jackson Five. We all dressed up to go and see them at Wembley, <laughs> and then I took my um, my daughter, my son, to see him at Wembley again all those years later, and um, at Wembley, and. Uh, but there was a difference between Jackson 5 and the Jacksons. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the big difference was oh, yeah. their lead singer. The lead singer wasn't around. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, he was a hell of a former. I, I, I think back to um, people talk about not seeing so many dance like Michael Jackson, but I saw James Brown. And James Brown was so dynamic on stage, much more um, uh, physical as a dancer than uh, Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson was very smooth and what have you, but James Brown, I thought, was a real physical dancer, if you know what I mean. You're right. James Brown is raw, like Cyril Regis, yeah, raw, you know, the silky, yeah. smooth uh, skills of Laurie Cunningham. Um, but that's where Michael Jackson got it from. He got the energy from. Okay, he refined it with looking at the dancing of... Um, you know, the Hollywood stars like, Fred, um, sorry. Um, Gene Kelly, maybe. And Gene Kelly, like, yeah. yeah, Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire. That's how he refined it. But he got it initially from James Brown. And we owe James Brown a lot. When James Brown died, this is how I knew that he was a proper, proper legend, even though, you know, obviously I've loved him ever since I was a kid. George Bush, who people remember for other reasons rather than this, um, James Brown died on Christmas Day, and I was on air that Christmas Day. It was, you know, suddenly it's a big story. George Bush was very quick out of the blocks to say James Brown was an American original. And when he said that, I thought George Bush actually understands what James Brown. I mean, isn't that something? The George well, Bush we're talking about is the George Bush of you know, Osama bin Laden and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, everything else that he said. Um, but uh, he, he kind of got it. And I thought, well, how many presidents of the United States have understood the art form of a musician, have, have bothered to do the musicians under their very I hadn't, hadn't heard that before, Dutton, so that's quite interesting. Yeah. No, it, it, it's a, it was a genuine, genuine memory in my mind. Cool for cats, Squeeze, were you into Squeeze? They're sort of like... Not particularly. Not no, particularly. No. I was, but anyway, that doesn't matter now that you're not. I'll, I'll quickly move on. Can we all say that Shawadi Wadi is a moment not to be remembered? Can we at least say that? Frankie, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move on as fast as we can. Love Ballad by George Benson is at number thirty-five. Oh yes, yes. I saw I saw George a couple of times live as well. Um, with his big uh, guitar. Um. He what, was, which uh, one? How many? <laughs> well, yes. Um, he was, yeah, he was a very good performer, very, very good on stage. I, li mm -hmm. I liked it. I mean, I, I think I was very fortunate seeing a lot of these um, stars uh, over a period of time. Every concert, every time Stevie Wonder was in town, I went to see Stevie Wonder. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, uh, remember, it's the Supremes, but I never saw the Supremes, but I saw Dana Ross mm. uh, later in life, you know, so... I think I was very fortunate in seeing um, those sort of stars with that sort of longevity in their careers. You know, you saw them from the beginning right the way through to maturity, if you know what I mean. I do know what you mean. Gloria Gaynor, that we've already mentioned. I yeah. Will Survive is at number 61. Um, it got to number one. It's now going down. Female the song, the female theme song. Yeah, yeah, but who knew at the time? I I nope. didn't have any idea at the time that this was the one that was going to resonate fifty years later. Or well, you know, long yeah, is. that one and the Commodores. Is it Commodores? Yes, Brick yes. House. Brick House. Yes, yes, yes. That was another. That's another. I mean, I went to see. Um, I've seen Lana Richie a couple of times when he does his back catalogue. Yeah. Um, he plays Brick House. All the women stand up. And they boogie to it. The men are sitting oh. down there with their arms folded, but <laughs> all the women are standing up, uh, boogieing to that. So that one and Gloria Gaynor, uh, they are called the female um, theme songs. Oh, there are, and there's one there's that a few, my, there's a few, but uh, they were the original. Yeah. One that my missus does is that one. The women get absolutely ballistic when she does this one. When she goes, "Didn't I say to you 
and you are the only one. Women go absolutely, I can't remember what it's called. Um, but yeah, when she plays that one, women go absolutely. If the guys just sit down, fellas, sit down. I would sit down during yeah, that one. Yeah. I can't remember what it's called off the top you're of not, my you're head. In, you're, not, you're not in this. You're not in this group. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm definitely not. Um, okay, so one tune in this chart that you would uh, take to your desert island, which is a one tune. Crikey. Um. Have you got the chart in front of you? No, no. Okay. Um, l let me give you some suggestions because now I think I've got a good idea of your taste in music. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I'm just going to give you some bullet points. Uh, well, Light of the World, Swinging. Do you remember Light of the World? Brit Funk. I swinging. Don't. Okay. N never mind that. Never mind that. I will survive, as I said, Gloria yeah. Gaynor. Um, or you go for Hot Stuff, Donna Summer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, average white band have done a decent version of Walk On By, which is in the charts at number 54, mm. by the way. Uh, in a circle, uh, they are kind of the slightly more rootsy version of Third World that we were talking about mm. before. In a circle, we've stopped breaking my heart. Um, uh, is in the charts. Um, I'm not, I swear, I'm not just going through the black artists because I'm did bring yeah, yeah, an average yeah. white band in there, but yeah, yeah. you know, after talking about the black versus white football, I don't want anybody to get get it twisted. Sister Sledge, he's the greatest dancer, well, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, that's a number 37. Yeah, that's a that's that is, a isn't it? Isn't it? That's and they still play today, yeah, 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 every day, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Love Ballad, George Benson, that we've mentioned. A moment or two ago, Boogie Wonderland, remember Earth, Wind and Fire. Yes, I'm going yes, through all yes. the soul tunes. Uh, the Runner, Three Degrees, the group from which you have been dubbed uh, the Third Degree. And Roxanne 97, Police. Uh, you didn't like the squeeze. Uh, oh, Bee Gees, Love You Inside Out is in there. Shake Your Body Down to the Ground, Jackson's, I said, is at yeah. number 12. And Knock on Wood, Amy Stewart, number nine. Yeah. Reunited, Peaches and Herb. Peaches and Herb, well, blind. That's, six. A, that's a throwback. That's yes. a biggie. Yeah. That's a biggie, yeah. though, you see. I like Sister so Sledge. I, I thought Sister, I, I totally forgot about that one. Sister it's, Sledge is a great let's track. Let's go for that. Yeah, I, let's go for that track. one. Yeah. I yeah. think you're absolutely right. I do think that is the best track in the uh, charts at this time, and possibly Boogie Wonderland as well. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, Brendan. The book is called The Third Degree. It's out later uh, this month, as in September, it'll yeah. come out. And the question, the final question is, why did it take you so long? What is writing that laborious? It's taking you 30, no, not 40 really. years, 40-something yeah, years, people, mate. A lot of people have asked me about that. And um, it's my, um, my kids kept on saying, and I've got five grandkids, and they kept on saying, you know, you, you should, my kids said, you've got to put it down as a record. But the, what really prompted me was, my father-in-law who lived to the ripe old age of 97 is um, my sister-in-law was prompting him to record his memoirs and she did it in the end. And he's, cool. he's a very successful businessman in Grenada. Um, one of the premier businessmen over there, very well known on the island. Uh, got an MBE, but not for business, but for sport. He supported um, a lot of um, cricketers. I used to carry bats over with me from um, Worcester. Um, Duncan Fernley cricket bats. Um, back to Grenada for, for, the, for some of their budding cricketers. And um, I thought I knew my father-in-law really well when he decided to record his book, his, his, um, his daughter, Cutie. I realised I didn't know him that well, his background, his backstory with his mum and this, that, and the other. Um, he always had a, an entrepreneurial spirit from a young lad. And gradually I thought I should put, I should record. I'm doing it for my family, really. I'm not doing it for anything in particular apart from a record for my grandkids, because my kids never saw me play. So my grandkids don't know about my career. Um, they don't know about their great grandma. So it's a record of that journey that started for me in Grenada in 1953, um, going to Trinidad, my family are Trinidadians, my mom's Grenadian, I'm Grenadian, and then uh, coming to England, um, never having seen football and having football as a career. And to this day, football still plays an important part of my life. Well, as your your teacher when you came over said, um, maybe you should try cricket. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> Maybe back into the game, yeah. <laughs> that was it. That was a spur I needed to, to really get going in football. Yeah, I was only nine. I, I think I was nearly starting to cry when he told me that. But, uh, all turned out well in the end. I'm not too bad. Basically, what we're trying to say is uh, you weren't as good at nine years old in football as you later became. Well, who is? Yes. Who is? It's been an absolute pleasure, Brendan. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on, Dutton. I really appreciate it.